Father, we come to you this morning with a grateful heart, with a sober mind. We're conscious that it's through your providence why we are alive and we have this privilege to be in your courts. And so we pray, Holy Father, that today's service will be a blessing. Whomsoever is listening, watching, present here today in the sanctuary, that the words which are spoken, the songs which are sung, the hymns, the scriptures, everything will add value to our lives. And may at the end of it, we be better for it. We ask every blessing over every person. In Jesus' name, amen. We praise the Lord God. As I mentioned before, you are watching the Church of God Sabbath keeping for those who are online. My name is Howard Green. I'm your moderator. Our host pastor, Pastor Maurice Blagrove. I want to greet him in the name of the Lord, along with the other ministers. I'd like to read for us this morning from the book of Acts chapter 2, from verse 36 through 47. That's Acts 2. I'm going to be reading from verse 36 to verse 47. I'm reading from the King James Version of the Bible, so um, you can, may follow along in any version you choose to. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts and said on to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of the Lord Jesus and the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children, and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God should call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they that gladly received the word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon, all, upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. Hallelujah. And all that believed were together and had all things common, and sold their possessions and goods, and parted them to all men, as every man had need. And they continued daily in one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. To the word of God we say, Amen. To introduce our teacher for this morning's lesson, Pastor Mark Hibbert, I'm going to invite you to stand with me and sing hymn number 289, Since I Have Been Redeemed. Our lesson for this morning is entitled, Home, House to House. And as I mentioned before, our teacher will be Pastor Mark Hibbert. I have a song I love to sing since I have been redeemed of my Redeemer's 
say your king since I have been redeemed since I have been redeemed since I have been redeemed I will glory in his name since I have been redeemed, I will glory in my Savior's name. I have a Christ that satisfies since I have been redeemed to do his will my highest price since I have been redeemed since I have been redeemed since I have been redeemed I will glory in his name since I have been I will glory in my Savior's name. I have a weakness bright and clear since I have been redeemed. Dispelling every doubt and fear. Since I have been redeemed, since I have been redeemed, since I have been redeemed, I will glory in his name. Since I have been redeemed, I will glory in his name. My Savior's name. I have a home prepared for me since I have been redeemed. Where I shall dwell eternally since I have been redeemed. I have been redeemed, since I have been redeemed, I will glory in his name, since I have been redeemed, I will glory in my Savior's name. We praise the Lord God. Amen. As the teacher is taking his stance, one of the things that we will be doing, you may be seated, one of the things that we'll be doing this morning is for the class, we'll be placing microphone in the aisles. And so if you have a comment, those who are in house, or if you have a question, you may go to one of the microphones and just stand and wait. And the teacher will acknowledge when you're able to ask the question or make your comment. And we are encouraging those who are online to do the same. You may use uh, the options in Zoom or those who are watching on YouTube. You may use either of those options to communicate, put your questions in the chat, or, or place your comments there as well. At this time, I'd like to present our teacher, Pastor Mark Hibbert, uh, with a lesson house to house. Please receive him.
Good morning. morning. Happy Sabbath. Sabbath. What a beautiful Sabbath it is. Uh, Another day we are alive and well. We're in our right minds. Um, I believe that we are here to worship the Lord. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I do want to greet uh, one and all for uh, this Sabbath that we are here enjoying one another's presence. Um, I do see that we have a number of guests with us this morning, and so please receive a warm greeting from the Church of God Sabbath Keeping here. God bless you for those who are here in person and for those who are uh, joining us online for our Sabbath school. I do want to greet uh, Pastor Howard Green, the senior minister for this congregation and for our organization, and our host pastor, Pastor Blaygrove, who is also a leader here at 312 Rexdale and the vice president of our organization. We celebrate these men for the work that they have done and for what God has in store for them. Can we say amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. We do have a a, a wonderful program for you this morning. Um, Going into our Bible study, I just want to give a, a brief recap for those who are joining us for the first time, and so that we understand where we're going with uh, this morning's Sabbath school. Um, In last week's lesson, and in the last two lessons, we, we mentioned that the first four lessons of our quarterly that we're dealing with is addressing the church, a faithful church. Matter of fact, the quarterly, the whole series, is on the faithful church. The first four lessons that we are beginning with, it's beginning with the the text, Acts chapter 2, that we read this morning, and it's focusing on how they continued in the apostles' doctrine. Matter of fact, we're going to read that very quickly. Acts chapter 2, reading from verse... Uh, 42, and it says, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, and fellowship, and in breaking of bread, and in prayers. And so this is where we're taking our first four lessons. We spoke of prayer extensively in our first two lessons where we spoke of the mountaintop. The mountaintop was basically a time where we all get together on our own with the Lord and pray. It's those moments where we receive divine revelation from the Lord on our own. And then our second lesson, we addressed um, prayer in a community setting. Uh, We called it the upper room, and we realized that the disciples, they met in the upper room, at the instructions of the Lord, and they prayed. We discussed that Jesus, he, in his last supper, he told the disciples to go and uh, prepare the upper room. We discussed that the upper room was like a roof terrace in a house. Um, It was an open air, but they met in informal settings where they were able to get a message across. And what it meant for the faithful church is that we all must gather together. There is a time to pray alone. As Jesus said, there's a time for you to pray in your closet. There's also a special time when the church, the the body of believers, gets together and we pray in one accord, allowing God to have access to our lives. Prayer we discussed is you giving God access. One would say, well, why should I pray if God already knows what I need. Well, because God has given you free will, and that free will, you must exercise your free will and allow God to work on your behalf. That doesn't mean we can limit God in terms of his sovereign will, but that just means that in your personal life, you must acknowledge him, the, the, the Proverbs uh, 3 says. In all your ways, we acknowledge him, so that he may direct all our paths. So today's lesson, it's going to focus on the apostles' doctrine as we see it from house to house. When I first read the lesson, I was like, well, how does 
the apostles' doctrine tie in with house to house. And it's very unique how the author put it together. So the objective for today, the objective for this morning's lesson is we are going to study the effective model that the early church had. As we know, the, the lesson study is based on the book of Acts and the early church. So the objective is to study the effective model that the early church used for church growth. And this is found in Acts chapter 2, verse uh, 42 and onward. All of these lessons, predominantly the first four lessons, we see that the Lord added to the church daily. And we see that these four key elements, not only these elements, but these four key elements in, in terms of what we're going to teach for the first four lessons, were pretty much the foundation of the early church. They continued in the apostles' doctrine, which was today. They continued in prayer, and they continued in fellowship, and in breaking of bread. And the scripture says the Lord added to the church daily. So the objective for today is we are going to see the close association between teaching and eating. Yes, you heard me correctly. We're going to see the close relationship. Uh, the author, he, he terms it as teaching and the table. We're going to see how closely the two are related. And we're going to see how, how the early church actually took, a, sorry, took advantage of of this house-to-house -house meeting to establish the apostles' doctrine. So we're going to read a bit, just to give a bit of context uh, to those who are not familiar with the early church in Acts. And we're just going to see the setting. We want to know what was this early church about? What were they feeling? What was the atmosphere like? And it's taken straight from the text, so we are going to read it. For those who have been believers for a while, um, the text is going to be very familiar. And so as we read, uh, pay close attention to the way that they lived. And as was said earlier, if you do have your questions or comments, we do have mics prepared here. Just simply approach the mic. And as I see you approach the mic, I will acknowledge that you do have a comment or a question, and I'll give space uh, for you. And if, if though, for those who are online, if you do have a comment or a question, please put it in the chat, and the AV team will do our best uh, to prepare the question, and in the later portion of the question, we'll answer uh, your thoughts as best as possible. Turn with me to Acts chapter 2, and we're just going to lay out the background of the early church, the background, lay out the setting of the early church. So we know that Jesus left and he left the disciples uh, with the mandate to go into all the world and preach the gospel in all the surrounding regions. It was clear that they must make this disciples of all men. And so Acts chapter 2, starting from verse 42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. 43, and fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. 44, and all that believed were together. That's very important. All that believed were together and had all things common, and sold their possessions and goods, and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they continuing with one accord in the temple and in breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praise God, and praising God and having favor with all the people and the Lord added to the church daily as such should be saved. Turn with me now to Acts chapter 5. And the context of Acts chapter 5 Peter and John, they went to uh, the temple to pray, and they met the man at the gate, beautiful, and they healed him of his infirmities, 
And all the people were wondering at Peter and John and the great miracle that was done. And the council, they were offended and they apprehended Peter and John and reprimanded them for preaching and teaching in the name of Jesus. Shortly after they were let go, here's where we take Acts chapter 5, reading from verse 41. And they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And daily in the temple and in every house, they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. So what do we learn from all of this? The early church, the setting was after the resurrection of Christ, they, they continued with the temple worship. Sometimes we say that the disciples, they just created church right away. No. The disciples, which became the apostles, they continued in temple worship. Uh, G Peter and John, they were going to the temple to, the pr to pray at the hour of prayer. They continued. But what we also see is that they also had such a yearning, such a desire, such an appetite for more that they met in houses. Now, we're not sure whether this initiative of meeting in houses was something that the apostles said to them that, you know what, we are commanded to meet in houses. The scripture does not make that clear. We're not sure how this initiative from house to house or how they started to gather in, in the brethren's home. I'm not sure how it started, but we see the effects of it. And it was powerful. Praise God. And so we see the early church, they got together and this movement gathered steam so much that the church actually did not have any lack. It was a very organized movement. The people got together and they sold all their goods. They sold all their possessions. And they, the scripture says that they laid it at the apostles' feet. They gave it to the leadership of the church. And they said, distribute it the way that you see fit. So it, it's clear that the church was on the same page. They were of one accord. They have of the same mind. This was the movement. And the movement was so powerful that it gained the attention of the Jewish sect, the council. It was so powerful that the people were joining together and supplying their needs for this movement. Uh, sadly, I, I want to draw the analogy. I think it's a good analogy. Depending on where you are is how you'll take it. But we see the, the trucker's convoy. And it, the truckers' convoy in Canada, it started as a, as a grassroots movement. Uh, but we see that the movement that started small, the people started funding it. And it started to become something greater than perhaps uh, what the government expected. And so this is a similar situation, that those who were persuaded in Christ they started out as a grassroots. It seemed as if it wasn't a threat. But when they seen souls being saved, when they seen money being funneled and fueled, and this movement being able to stabilize and, and support itself, it was a huge threat to the Jewish council. So we see a great movement. But what is so unique is that they were of, on, of the same mind. They had the same mind. They had the same goals, the same intentions. And we know how dangerous that can be when a group of people gather together of one mind. So I just want to provide a little bit of proof that they went from house to house. It just wasn't temple worship. It just wasn't in the synagogues, but it was in their personal homes that they gathered together. They brought the church together. A number of believers gathered on other days, not on the Sabbath day only, but on other days of the week. They gathered together, and we'll see what they gathered to, together to do in those homes. We, we see further proof that they gathered in homes because in Acts chapter 3, 
in Acts chapter 8, verse 3, rather, we hear of Saul. And the Bible says that Saul used to go and enter into these homes, enter into these establishments, being a part of the Jewish council at that time. He entered into these homes and he went into there physically and dragged people out because he did not approve of this new way. They called it the way. They did not approve of this movement that was gathering so much steam. Paul being so zealous at the time called Saul, being so zealous, he went in there and he went literally hauling men out, having the permission from the Jewish council. We see a number of other um, home churches. In Acts chapter 12, we spoke of it last week, that while Peter was in prison, the church was praying. And they weren't praying in the synagogue. They weren't praying in the temple. They were praying in the house. From house to house, they went worshiping. So they were praying in the house in um, John, Mark, John Mark's mother's house, actually, in Acts chapter 12, verse 12. And Peter was delivered. We addressed that last week, which was speaking of a form of upper room. We also see that in the house of Lydia in Acts chapter 16, she also, Lydia, I believe she was a seller of purple, and Paul deemed her faithful, and we realized that at some period the church gathered in her house. Last but not least, we see Priscilla and Aquila, one of the later converts. Uh, Paul meeting them in Ephesus, he expounded to them the more excellent way. And Romans chapter 16, from 3 to 5, it explains that they eventually had the church in their house. So this movement had regional churches from house to house in different areas that if you lived in that area, you came to that area and you worshipped in that house. And the scripture says that the church grew. And today is for us to look at how can we take the examples? How can we take the examples of the early church? Is there anything that we can implement, any examples that we can take from what we are reading and studying and implement them into the church today, into the modern congregating of believers? And is there anything that we can implement that will expand the kingdom of God. So let, let's turn to the principle of teaching and eating. Because today's lesson is about teaching at the table. What were they doing in those houses? What were they doing in their daily meetings? They were praying and they were studying the scriptures. They were so zealous, we heard about the Bereans who went and studied the word. The early church was studying the apostles' doctrine. And we're going to get to what the apostles' doctrine is. But there's something powerful about praying and fellowship, fellowshipping at the same time. In the modern day context, have you ever heard of, in the business world, depending on the industries that you work in. Have you ever heard of lunch and learn? Lunch and learn? So it's an interesting principle, but basically what they've done is they have, they've discovered that you can get, get much more done if you gather in these lunch and learn settings. And what, what the lunch and learn setting is is when the company prepares training for their employees, they prepare sessions for their employees to come together, and they train them over lunch. They train them over lunch, they train them over a meal. And what they have discovered, the benefits of this social gathering that's mixed with training They've, studies have shown that it decreases employee turnover. Again, keep in mind that we're discussing the church, but we're seeing the benefits that the world has taken advantage of. Number one, 
These lunch and learns, they've proven that it decreases employee turnover. It builds a strong culture that fosters a sense of purpose. It fosters a sense of loyalty. And it deepens the relationship between coworkers. That's powerful. Number two, it improves morale. Study shows that in those work environments, when people are enjoying what they're doing, when they feel comfortable about what they're doing, it increases the efficiency. People are extremely motivated to do their job. And so the people of the world have discovered that there are different methods to teaching and to advancing their business. Thirdly, it encourages teamwork. You know, the more that you get to know people, the more that you know, get to know people in that social setting, is the less you assume things about someone. Is the easier you want to collaborate different projects with them. So they have used this lunch and learn. It's a very soft approach, but it has so much benefits. And the corporate world has used it. But last but not least, it improves the overall knowledge of the employees. They have proven that as they study in these lunch and learns, people, people learn a lot more than their department, a lot more than their specific job. But they learn other departments. They learn what others are doing, others are doing in other areas of the company. So the benefit of the lunch and learn, the benefit of eating and teaching is something that the business world has taken advantage of for a long time. Now my question to us is, and the, the question to you is, do we see this example in a biblical context? Do we use this uh, initiative, do we use this tool for the gospel? Does this initiative have any place in the church? It's lunch and learn. Well, turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 6, and we're going to see the wisdom of the Lord. Deuteronomy chapter 6, and Moses speaking tells Israel, reading from verse 4, he says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. Verse 6, And these words which I command thee this day shall be in your heart. Not only should they be in your heart, but verse 7, And you shall teach them diligently to your children. And you shall talk with them when thou sittest in thine house, when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. The idea of when thou sittest down is when you come to sit down for a meal, you should teach your children the way of the Lord. There's something powerful that happens when we are teaching and eating. It is a powerful concept. It's not a concept that the world has created, but the Lord knows that it has much benefit. Matter of fact, many of the feasts, the feast of the Lord, think about it. Many of the feast of the Lord is associated around the table. While we learn about the feast and while the feasts foreshadow great things to come, you partake of a meal. And the wisdom of the Lord would have it that we learn so much more around a table, around a meal. A meal in so many different cultures gathers people together and it allows us to learn. It's the concept of lunch and learn. We, we also see that Jesus, the master teacher, turn with me to Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9. We're going to see the technique that Jesus used uh, to teach. Matthew chapter 9, reading from verse 10. And it came to pass, as Jesus sat at meat in the house, 
Behold, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. Sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. Where did they sit? To have a meal. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto his disciples, Why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? But when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, They that be whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. But go ye and learn what that meaneth, and I will have mercy and not sacrifice, for I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Jesus used a different method to reach the people. Jesus used a different method to declare the truth of God. The Bible says they were asking, why is he sitting down with sinners and publicans? And Jesus basically responded that this is my ministry. And this is the technique that I am using. I sit down and eat and drink with them. Why? Because it's easier to teach people around a table with common interests. Sometimes we, in our workplaces, instead of going out for a lunch dinner or, sorry, a lunch event, we choose to separate ourselves and rather just to speak to our co-workers about Christ. Perhaps today we can take a different approach. Perhaps we can go on a lunch date. Perhaps we can go on a lunching, a luncheon. And at that table, there is something that happens when you feel comfortable. You know, they, they, they accuse Jesus of being a glutton. They accuse Jesus of um, using this method so much that they said that Jesus, he loved to eat. But he wasn't a glutton. He had a technique. He knew what worked for men. And this is something admirable for those churches that we see around us that are growing exponentially. Why? Because they have learned the art of teaching and eating. There is something powerful that happens when we gather together in a social aspect and we are able to teach while we eat, able to teach while we socialize. We cannot be so, sorry, we cannot be so spiritual. We cannot be so spiritual that we cannot come down and speak to people as they're human beings. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Matter of fact, it's preferred that you approach those who do not know Christ and even those, our own brethren, as a human being. We must be able to, to be approachable. We must be able to be relatable. And I believe that this is the power of teaching and eating that the early church uh, used as a method. Not only did Jesus teach and eat sinners and publicans, but his own disciples. When Jesus resurrected, the Bible says he came back to his disciples, and what did he do? He asked them, do you have anything to eat. And the Bible says he boiled fish and I believe it was honey. When I researched that, I said I have never tried that. Fish and honey. And the Bible says that he continued to explain to them, to expound what has really happened. So it's a technique that works. Jesus used it, the apostles used it, and it is proven that the church grew daily as the Lord would have it. And the Bible says in these teaching and eating, their understanding was open. On the road to Emmaus, the, the scripture says that the two men were speaking and Jesus declared to them more clearly what Moses, was, Moses had written about him. And the Bible says after they knew who he was, they asked him, come and dine with us. And the Bible says that Jesus, he ate with them and he explained more the scriptures. It is a powerful technique. It is a powerful tool for us to teach and to eat. For us to fellowship and to declare the word of the Lord. And this works both for brethren 
and this works also uh, for witnessing, witnessing to sinners and publicans. Let me stop there. Is there any thoughts or comments before we go into the second portion of the teaching? You can just approach the mic if you have a thought or comment. If not, we'll go forward. All right. So the question is, they were gathering from house to house, and they were teaching the apostles' doctrine. What is the apostles' doctrine? We hear about it so often. What is meant by the apostles' doctrine? You can put it in the chat, or you can um, make a note for yourselves. What is the apostles' doctrine? And how does the apostles' doctrine differ from the doctrine of Christ? I'll give you a minute to think about that. What is the apostles' doctrine? What is meant by the apostles' doctrine? Did the apostles have their own doctrine? And how does the apostles' doctrine differ from the doctrine of Christ? The root word for doctrine in the Greek, it simply means teaching. 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 So the apostles' teaching, how does it differ from the teachings of Christ? The apostles' teaching is simply the application of the teachings of Christ. When Jesus met with the disciples and taught them, he taught them his doctrine. And Jesus made it clear that his doctrine is not his own, but it is of the Father. So Jesus taught the disciples his doctrine, his teaching, and the, the, the apostles, in turn, taught the brethren how to apply the teachings of Christ. What is the apostles' doctrine? The apostles' doctrine is the application of the teachings of Christ. The apostles' doctrine is the application of the teachings of Christ. Not everything was made clear when Christ taught. In the early church, there were some stumbling blocks where they came upon where they had questions. In the church in Antioch, we're going to learn in further lessons, in church in Antioch, they had a question about circumcision. And they asked, they asked the apostles, is circumcision still necessary? Because some said that circumcision was absolutely mandatory. And the apostles went forward, they went back to Jerusalem, they had counsel, and they came out with one succinct teaching. This is the apostles' doctrine. The apostles taught and applied the principles that Jesus taught them. And they came forward and said, well, circumcision is no longer applicable, it's no longer needed, and we're not going to lay any burden upon those who are just coming in. So the apostles, they came out with this teaching, and it became the apostles' doctrine. Many of the things that the apostles declared in the epistles are the apostles' doctrine. What other things are the apostles' doctrine? When it came to sexual immorality, the apostles came out with a teaching. Uh, there was a situation in the Corinthian church where a man had his... Uh, father's wife. It, it was his stepmother. And the Bible says in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, reading from verse 4, the Apostle Paul, he was writing and giving his take on it. And he says, In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together, and my spirit with the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, this is what you should do to such a person. Verse 5, to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit might be saved in the day of the Lord. Verse 11, but now I have written unto you not to keep company, if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator, or a covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, with such an one know not to eat. So the Apostle Paul gave his teaching 
on the situations that were happening in those days, and these teachings became the apostles' doctrine. All of the epistles, the, the application of Jesus' teaching became the doctrine that they taught. Now, how does it differ from Christ? It doesn't. There's many scriptures that speak of Paul saying, I am going to make a judgment, and I have what? The Spirit of God. So the teachings of the apostles is still the teachings of Christ. And the scripture says in many of his letters that he wrote to the churches, perhaps even to the churches in um, individuals' houses, he says, when I come, when I come, I will set things in order. So they were meeting in house to house. They were searching the scriptures. They were searching to see how it's a applicable and they were also breaking bread. We often quote in our churches that we ought to break bread. Well, we should break bread. But we also are not just breaking bread and speaking anything. We are breaking bread and we are teaching, preaching, and exhorting one another of how to live as a believer. We are speaking of the scriptures. We're speaking of the principle of the scriptures, that it enlightens us and helps us to go forward. It's a powerful concept. House to house, they went teaching and preaching the apostles' doctrine. And there's many other texts that were addressed in the epistles, the coming of Christ. The apostles gave their take on it. In 2 Peter chapter 3, uh, Peter makes it clear that the Lord is not slack concerning his promises. He made it very clear that the early church should expect the coming of the Lord. Verse 10, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Again, the early church understood the coming of the Lord through the teaching of the apostles. They understood the offices that were supposed to take place and the prerequisite for the offices of the church, where did they learn that? They did not necessarily learn it through the teaching of Christ, but through the apostles' doctrine. The apostle Paul said, if, the, if a man desire the office of a bishop, he should be the husband of one wife and so forth. So the apostles made it clear of the teaching that the early church should um, abide by. And these teachings were discussed, they were elaborated, they were debated in these house-to-house -house meetings. Now, how do we make this applicable for the church today? Many churches, many, many churches, and if you, may, you might be a church listening to this program today, Many churches have grown their ministry through what is called a cell group. This is a house-to-house -house meeting where different regions across the country, across the province, across the state, depending on where you are, have selected leaders to gather saints in their homes perhaps having one agenda, perhaps having one lesson, perhaps having um, one script, and allowing people to um, use different material to bring forth the information. Is this something that the church today can benefit from? Is this an, a tool that we can use to grow the church? The topic is a faithful church. We've seen it worked in Acts. We have the opportunity to start up small groups. Why? Why would we start small groups? Well, in the corporate world, we've seen the advantages, but let's apply it to the church. Small groups, gathering in settings like this, such as house to house, and if we meet in your house, there should be a meal. Jesus never sent the people away hungry. He always fed the people and taught the people, so there should be a meal associated with it. And so how does this apply to the church? What are the benefits? Well, when we meet in these groups, these smaller groups, we see that it decreases member turnover. 
There are many people who are going from church to church. It seems to be the evolution of the modern day church. We're hopping from one church to the next, searching for purpose. Sometimes these small groups, they foster a way of belonging, a, a sense of purpose, a sense of loyalty. And this method is proven that in small groups where you get to know people, you, you tend to uh, be less offended. It's a powerful tool that the church can use today. What else can we do? It improves morale. Even as in the business world, so in the spiritual. It makes serving Christ enjoyable. You are part of a group. You are part of a network. Many people in our churches today, they don't feel a part of any network. Many people, they come into church and they are excluded. They feel excluded. They don't feel a part of the greater body. And this is what these house-to-house -house meetings can do. While we teach the Word of God, we gain the benefit of boosting morale, allowing people to feel good about themselves, allowing people to be a part of a movement. So it, it can improve our overall morale. Thirdly, how it encourages teamwork. Many ministries, there are many churches who their ministries feel siloed. Siloed meaning fragmented, feel apart. Well, when we have these house-to-house -house meetings, when we gather together, even ministry leaders begin to collaborate. In the business world, they collaborate with different departments. In the church, as we meet from house to house, as we discuss the Word of God, and as we are edified, we realize that, hey, it's not that bad to work with different people. So it fosters collaboration. These house-to-house -house visits, while we teach and while we eat, it allows the church to grow. It allows ministries to be born out of this um, intimate setting. It's a powerful tool. And last but not least, it improves the overall knowledge of our church. You may not be able to get all that you need from a Sabbath school service. You may be timid to um, engage in a formal setting. But when we are in these close-knit circles, discussing the word, you are more likely, people are more likely to ask a question that they feel is foolish and be able to get an answer that is not only explained once, but many times and from different viewpoints. So there is much advantage to not just, as we will learn about next week, not just temple, so to speak, a formal setting of worship, but there's much in advantage to the church gathering in these informal gatherings from house to house, eating and teaching, breaking bread and having fellowship. There's much to be gained. And if you're someone who is timid, or if you're someone who doesn't feel like you belong, a house to house visit, a house to house gathering might just be what you need. It's a very powerful tool. And so I'm going to stop here. But if there's any thoughts or comments, we will um, engage. If there's any questions online, I'll take your questions. But please keep in mind that even if this is not happening formally, it doesn't mean that if you live in a region where you have many believers, that you yourself cannot call believers together and form these house-to-house -house gatherings. We do not know how it started. We did not read that the apostles decreed that you must go from house to house, but we know that it was effective. And this was one element that allowed the church to grow daily, and the Lord added to the church as needed. So I'll take any questions or comments. I'm going to ask the AV team to put it forward. And if not, we will close out for this week, and next week we'll address 
temple worship. Let me see if there's any questions online. You can just approach the mic, please. Thank you, Pastor. Yes, um, no problem. In the time of persecution, the early church had to hide away. And I, what, what I've learned in this lesson so far this morning from the pastor is that it is a good thing to, to reach out and, and be in homes. It's more comfortable. It's more, um, it's a smaller gathering. It's more, um, there's comfort and warmth there, which should really be in the church. We should really have warmth and comfort in the church. But uh, as time passed, churches has become a call, a place for a lot of people. And not only that, but we have noticed that we are living in the last days. And persecution will come again to the church as it did in the past. Amen. And one of the things that we, we, we may have to do is to meet in our homes again. It, it will not only be, um, it will not only be a, a, a thing of comfort, but it may be a thing that we have to do. And we may have to rely on it. So uh, not only um, as our pastor is saying this morning that, and he's encouraging us to meet in our homes, but it will probably be a thing of the future. And it's sad to say that our churches, when we go to churches, I, I am from the UK and I'm visiting, but I'm not talking about one church. I'm talking about churches around the world. Amen. The churches have become cold places, and it shouldn't be. But besides that point, uh, besides that point, churches, we are uh, Christian people will be persecuted again as the first Christians. The Bible states that we are living in the last days, and we will have to be formed again, meet again in comfort to give each other comfort and to teach others and to reach out to others and to strengthen ourselves to go forth with the message of Jesus Christ. Because we, in these last days, we are the soldiers of Jesus Christ and we have to take the message forward because there's a lot of people out there that God wants into his family, into his kingdom. God wants Jesus Christ wants us all to come up to him in his kingdom. He loves us. He really does love us. He loves the drunks. He loves the sinners. And he wants us as soldiers to get out there, get to those people, and bring them to, to him, to bring him to his family. And I feel strongly that in times we will have to to meet in our homes and congregate and talk about this and see how we can strengthen each other, see how we can teach each other, how we can talk about our mission work. Amen. Because there will become a time Amen. when authorities will not like what we are talking about. They will not agree with what we are talking about. Amen. Because remember, we are not of this world. We are passing through. We are Amen. passing to get up there eventually. Amen. That is our hope. And our God is real. He's, he, he's, he's real. He's powerful. He is the creator. And he put us here, and we are his soldiers down here. So let's strengthen ourselves. And when we meet in our homes, let's be missionaries. Let's get out there and teach others. But we, sometimes we have to meet together to strengthen each other. Because you might have one strong one or one, one weak one or one middle one. Yeah. Let's get together, Amen. as the pastor says. Not just, uh, I know the corporate world is doing this lunch and this. And learn. Uh, and, learn. and learn for their business mm. to make sure their, their, the money goes into their, into their bank account. They have more money right and it's all about business it's all about money 
But we are not about business, we are not about money. We are here as soldiers to get more of those people all around Amen. to know who Jesus Christ is, our Lord and our Savior. Praise God. Praise and, God. And, 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 and that's, that's the aim. And may all of you here, when you leave this place, have God in your heart and a strength in your, in your, in your feeling, in your heart, in your head that you ought to read the Bible, because one day the Bible will be taken away from us. Read the Bible, study the Bible, and get out there, and teach it, and preach it. Thank Amen. You, Thank you so much. Wonderful. I applaud you, our, our dear sister. Um, the context of the early church meeting in houses was, very, was that very same thing, Pre because there was pressure. And they could meet freely in their homes and worship Christ without Judaizers, without those um, oppressing them. Uh, it led them, perhaps, to the house-to-house -house meetings. And I do agree with you, sister, that the time will come where perhaps the formal meeting place of churches may not be available. And we will have to gather in homes. There's a comment online which I believe our question online, which I believe is, is in line uh, with that same thought that our, our very sister made. It's, um, they're asking, can we comment on the text that says, do not forsake the assembling of brethren together? People usually refer to this as coming to the building. Now, I don't believe it's necessarily coming to the building as they were meeting in homes, but the idea is corporate worship. The idea is corporate worship, is coming together. Now, there is a difference with someone who says, well, I can serve the Lord on my own. Uh, perhaps I can watch online, or perhaps I can read my Bible on my own, and I do not necessarily need the fellowship of others. Well, in that context, then no, you are forsaking the assembling of the, of the brothers together. There must be, in Christianity, in this faith, there must be a joint collective coming together for worship. There must be congregational um, fellowship and worship. Now. One would say, well, what if I'm being persecuted? Obviously, you are going to do what you have to do. But while you have the ability, while you have the chance, while you have the opportunity, we ought to come together as believers, strengthening one another. As our dear sister said, we need to encourage one another. The Bible says we need to exhort one another. How do you exhort one another when you are not together? And there's something happens when the body of Christ comes together bodily. We see each other's countenance. We are strengthened. So if one chooses to stay away, it's, it's rather selfish. And I'm not, please don't take it the wrong way. Everyone ha may have their reasons why they're staying away. I'm not speaking to your specific reason. Perhaps you're sick or perhaps something has happened. I'm speaking to the idea that you do not want to be amongst brethren. And this faith is not an individual faith. It's a collective faith. We are a family. We are a body. Even if perhaps our sister from England, she is miles away, thousands of miles away, but she is still a sister here, because we are brothers and sisters in Christ. And so we need the fellowship. The fellowship ought to be felt, and as much as possible, we come together bodily to worship together, to study together, to have fellowship and break bread together. I think that that's very important. Any other thoughts or comments? If not, we will end the lesson here, and next week we will take up the latter portion of the foundational principles that laid the early church in terms of temple fellowship.
All right, seems like there's no other questions. Thank you for your time. God bless you. And I pray that we will implement as much as possible these house-to-house -house visits as much as we can because it does have much benefits. God bless you. In Jesus' name. Praise the Lord God. I want to thank God for Pastor Hibbert. Could you give God thanks for him, church? I think a lot of us still think we're online. We're actually here. So, <laughs> so when you actually clap your hand or say something, it actually makes a difference now. Um, you're not muted. All right, so can we give God thanks for Pastor Hibbert again? That's much better. Thank you, Mark, for the amazing uh, word that God has given to you. Uh, we're so thrilled by what God is doing in your life and continue to do in terms of your excelling in, in scripture and teaching. I want to take this opportunity. That was Linda, by the way, the person who spoke. That was Linda, our sister from uh, England. And beside her is Bobby. So that's Linda and Bobby. I want to thank you both for taking the time to be here. And we trust that your time will be rewarded with a blessing. Amen. Amen. I think it is also appropriate to take this time to also welcome um, a friend of Sidoni's that's here with us today. Uh, and so I'd like to uh, Muir Edwards. Is she here? Oh, there you are. Okay. I want to thank you for joining as well. Trust that you will enjoy the service and uh, maybe make this your home church if you don't have one. Uh, again, we want to thank all the beloved brethren for coming out today. If you're watching for the first time, this is the Church of God Sabbath Keeping. We are in Toronto. Specifically, we are at 312 Rexdale Boulevard in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. And so uh, thank you for your patronage. We trust that the service today will be a blessing to you. Um, at this time, we are going to conclude this part of the service and transition into a worship experience. Now, we have a few more weeks before we have the live praise and worship. I think they are slated for April, and so we are still going to be using pre-recording. But um, as we transition, we're asking you to still, uh, although they taped the, the praise and worship, it's still magnificent. So please join in when we get there. We always like to give an opportunity for our guests and members to give their offering. So at this time, if you're in the building, I'm going to invite you to come forward. Baskets are placed at the front. Um, if you have brought cash, you can put your offerings in the basket. If you would like to give online, for those who are watching, uh, you can see the information on the screen. You can go to our website at www cogsabbath.com you can scroll down to the bottom you'll see a link that says give and that will allow you to give an offering you can also uh, if you're Canadian you can register this account finance.cogsabbath at gmail.com let me repeat that uh, finance.cogsabbath at gmail.com you can register that and you can offer your tithe and offering through that channel and lastly, if you'd like to mail it in, the address is 312 Rexdale Boulevard, Toronto, Ontario, Canada. And there is a postal code, which is M9W1R6, if you're watching, it's online. And so before we pray and transition out, I'd like you, us to stand and sing hymn number 170, He Lives. That's hymn number 170, I serve a risen Savior, He's in the world today. I know that he is living. Whatever men may say. Amen, church?
God lives. God is real. Amen. And God is worthy to be acknowledged. I serve a risen Savior, he's in the world today. I know that he is living, whatever men may say.
Hallelujah. He lives. Praise the name of the Lord God. Hallelujah. He lives. Amen. Let us pray. Father, I feel your Holy Ghost in this house even now. There is a true testimony in our spirits that not only do you exist, not only do you live, but you live within our hearts. So we are encouraged by the words of the author this morning. Rejoice, rejoice, O Christian. Lift up your voice and sing. Eternal hallelujah to Jesus Christ the King. Hallelujah. We honor him this morning for his goodness, for the sacrifice that was done at Calvary. And we know it was the blood that saves. We thank you for the gathering of the saints here today, those online and those in the building. We thank you for their love offering. They give out of gratitude. They give out of thanksgiving for all that you have done for us. And all our needs have been supplied by the great God of heaven according to your riches and glory. Let the church praise him. And so as we acknowledge that goodness, Father, we now will enter into a moment of praise. May our hearts be enriched right now. Amen. Hallelujah. As we reflect on our week, our years, our decades, our experience, our journey, the goodness of the Lord which passeth all understanding, may we worship with that reality, giving you thanks always to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who by your immutable counsel hath given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. And so, Lord, we thank you today. May the people who have given be blessed. And those who did not have, for we recognize that those, there are those who are going through struggles. We ask God that you will visit their situation, that you will turn it around. Amen. That they will not be discouraged as they wait upon the Lord. For it is written, they that wait upon the Lord, hallelujah, shall mount up with wings as an eagle. So we thank you, Father. We give you the praise. Amen. Amen. At this time, I ask you to remain standing. We are going to worship God now in spirit and in truth. God bless you.
great and mighty is our God. Great and mighty is.
God, somebody just open your mouth. <laughs> somebody say something sweet to the Lord. <laughs> God, we owe you everything. We're forever grateful, God, for your grace, for your mercy, for your love, yeah, for your compassion. Great is your faithfulness, oh God. Morning by morning, new, new mercies we see, God. Great is your faithfulness, God. We owe you everything. Oh, somebody go ahead and pour out everything for him today open your mouth give him the fruit of your lips which is the sacrifice of praise somebody give him everything somebody give him everything somebody give him everything we lay it down before you God we lay it all down we lay the only one worthy you're the only one holy you've been keeping me even when I didn't want to be kept God yeah. I just want to tell you thank you I just want to tell you thank you I just want to tell you thank you Come on, come on, right where you are, just open your mouth for the next 15 to 20 seconds. Somebody just give him the fruit of your lips. Somebody tell him something. Somebody declare that he's beautiful. Someone declare the Lordship of Christ. To the only wise God. Hey, be a blessing and glory and honor and power, dominion, both now and forever. <laughs> your voice and declare you Lord our worthy say you
that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father to the glory of God the Father oh yeah somebody just breathe him in We reverence you, God. We see you, God, high and lifted up. And your train fills this temple. We pause right here to honor you. We pause right here to honor you. All hail King Jesus. All hail Emmanuel. Come on, raise your sound. He's here. He's here. Somebody reverence the Lord. Oh God, we give you glory. Oh God, we give you glory. Right here, right now, God, we pause to honor you. Hey, we pause to honor you, yeah. We pause. right here and give you glory we give you all the glory we Zion, raise your voice and tell them now, sir. 
Hallelujah. Praise God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Stand where you are. Just can we just take one minute right here? You know, it was necessary that we were home because of the virus that was going around, but we are in the presence of God right now, collectively, collectively. And I think right here we should just take a moment and just let whatever is inside of us. It's been almost two years and just there's stuff inside of us that we want to shout out, you know? It doesn't even have to be loud, it just has to be real. Hallelujah, glory to God. Would you praise the Lord? Just praise Him from that place. Just praise Him from that place that almost two years, this, not in the congregation of the just, just praise Him because He's worthy to be praised. Just acknowledge Him that He is good and His truth is everlasting and it endures through all generations. Hallelujah. I heard the writer declares, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Is there anyone in this house who knows that God is good? That God is good. That is God that allowed us to breathe right now. That it's God that kept us on the land of the living. It was God who made us and not we ourselves. Will you open your mouth and give God a praise in the hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. All praise and glory. All wisdom and might. All blessings and honor unto him that sits upon the throne and unto his Christ, even Jesus of Nazareth. Hallelujah. Be wisdom. Hallelujah. Oh Lord God, the church, praise your name. Lord Jesus, all your brethren, praise and adore your great and mighty name. You are worthy to be praised. And we give you all the glory. Hallelujah. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that puts his trust in God. God is your refuge and fortress. God is your present help in the time of trouble. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Blessed be your name, O Lord God, who giveth life and breath and strength. Hallelujah. Thank you so much for being in the presence of God this moment. You may be seated. If you are watching us online, you are watching the Church of God Sabbath Keeping. We are here at 312 Rexdale Boulevard. Much greetings to our pastor, Pastor Maurice Blaygrove, wonderful man of God, and to his family. To all the other ministers, including Pastor Lynch and Astacio, who is our speaker for today. All the musicians, all the guests that have joined us uh, this morning. Linda, Bobby, Muir, and all others who are here today to worship God. We thank God for you. I'd like to give the preacher as much time as possible, and so we'd like to commence the service right now with the use of hymn number 105 from our worshiping song. This great hymn was written by Eliah Hoffman and is one of the most notable hymns as it relates to the blood of Jesus Christ. And so after the organist plays the introduction, may I invite you to stand so we can give, sing together and give God honor. That's hymn number 105. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully 
trusting in his graceless or are you washed in the blood of the lamb are you washed in the blood in the soul cleansing blood of the lamb are your garments spotless are they blood of the Lamb. Are you walking daily by the Savior's side? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Do you rest each moment in the crucified? Are you washed in the blood of blood of the Lamb. When the bridegroom cometh, will your robes be white? Oh, do washed in the blood of the Lamb. Will your soul be ready for that mansion bright? Are you washed in the blood Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Lay aside the garment that are stained with sin and be washed in the blood of the Lamb. There's a fountain flowing for the soul clean oh be washed in the blood of the lamb are you washed in the blood in the soul cleansing blood of the lamb are your garments spotless are they white as snow Amen. Let us pray. Father, we present now this part of the service to you. We commit the preacher to your care. As a man, he has come to you for direction and for guidance as to what to speak to the congregation. We pray now, Lord, the inspiration will be upon him, that all the things that you have placed in his heart, it will manifest. We pray for those who have brought an offering and their tithe to give to the ministry. We pray that you will bless it. We commit now our hearts to you, that as we listen to your word, let it have transforma transformational power, that it speak to the things which are in our lives, which need to be strengthened. And may we, when we leave this place, say truly, it was good to be here. We ask these blessings now. Amen. I'm going to ask you to turn your scriptures with me to the book of Isaiah chapter 53. We're reading from verse 1 to verse 11. That's Isaiah chapter 53, verse 1 through verse 11. When you found it, say amen. I'd like to read from the King James Version of the Bible. 
Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of the dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid it as it were our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace is upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He's brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living, for the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he hath done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When he, ha when he shall make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see off all the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many. He shall bear their iniquities. To God be the glory. Hallelujah. Amen. Glory to God. It is customary to read from the book of Exodus chapter 20. May I invite you to turn there with me. That is Exodus chapter 20. We're going to read from 1 to 17. This is the Decalogue. This is the unchangeable word of God. Hallelujah, I believe it. It reads like this. And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in the heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested on the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. To the word of God we say, Amen. James concludes this in chapter 2 of his epistle. And verse 8, 
let us read. If ye fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. But if ye have respect to persons, ye commit sin and are convinced of the law as transgressors. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. For he that said, do not commit adultery, said also, do not kill. Now if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. So speak ye, and so do, as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. You may be seated. To the word of God we say, Amen. As the preacher is about to come to speak to us today, those who have brought a tithe of the believers, you may bring your tithe forward. There are baskets at the front. If you are visiting and you have an offering and you would like to deposit that offering, you may bring your offering also. For those online or perhaps in house who would like to use a different method, we can use what is called an e-transfer. This is for Canadians. You can add these words, finance.cogsabbath at gmail.com. Again, that's finance.cogsabbath at gmail.com. You can register that as a payee. You can go to our website also at cogsabbath.com. That's cogsabbath.com. You can scroll down to the bottom of the page. You will see a page, a link that says give. You can click on the link and that will allow you to give to the ministry. And of course, you can mail in your offering at 312 Rexdale Boulevard. It's in Toronto, Ontario, M9W1R6. At this time, I'd like to invite the preacher to come forward. Brethren and friends, it is my esteemed privilege to bring forth to the stage right now the minister of the gospel in no less person than Pastor Lynch and Anastasio. May I invite you to stand and receive him? We praise the Lord. Let the church praise the Lord again, for he is worthy to be praised. Praise the Lord. I'm sure you will agree with me that he is worthy to be praised. Praise God. Bless the Lord in his house today. Let's clap your hands and magnify the Lord. Praise the Lord. David said, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. Bless the Lord and truly we know that God's name is above every other name. Amen. He has a name that is above every other name preacher. Praise the Lord. I don't care who you are. I know Trump is a big name. Obama is a big name. The queen, she don't even have to need, need to know her name. She's the queen. Praise the Lord. But Lord Jesus Christ, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the conquering lion of the tribe of Judah. Praise the Lord. He's a rose of Sharon, the lily of the valley and the bright and morning star. He is to be praised. Bless the Lord. And as long as we are in his house today, that's the order of the day. We come to give him praise. We come to give him glory. We come to magnify his name. Praise the Lord. David said, come magnify the Lord with me. And let us exalt his name together. He deserves to be exalted, church of God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord for all the good things that he have done. Amen. David said, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. Praise God. Praise him for his goodness. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him for his excellent greatness. Let everything that hath breath Hallelujah. praise the Lord. Praise ye the name of the Lord. Praise the Lord. I know I can speak for you as well as I can speak for myself. That you and I are here just because of the goodness of God. Praise the Lord. In spite of everything that we see that's happening around us. There's so much death and destruction. There's, there's wars, rumors of war, pestilence, earthquake in diverse places. I mean, just looking at the TV screen is so depressing. Praise the Lord. But there's a songwriter that says, through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. And through it all, I've learned to trust in God. Praise the Lord. And truly, brethren, you know, I'm listening to 
the sister sing the song. And I'm saying, Pastor Green, that the way the Lord has, has, has structured our redemption, we can't help but praise him. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. And I think the very nature of the word that God has given is to take us back to who we are and to the lengths and breadth that God has gone for his people. Yes, Praise the Lord. We're not here by chance. God has a purpose for us, church of God. Praise the Lord. And he has worked out that purpose from before the foundation of the world. Praise the Lord. You and I was designated for this day. I don't know how you think of yourself. But when I look back at the word of God and I recognize the things that God has done. You and I, Pastor Green, was designated for this day. March the 5th. 2022 here in Toronto Canada praise the Lord I want to welcome everyone it's so good to see faces praise the Lord and uh, usually most of the times we just focus on the camera because then we connect with you at home but now we have to move around a bit like it's beautiful it's beautiful and soon the day would come when we can get to see the entire face one more time, those beautiful faces and the expression of love and gratitude to God. Praise the Lord. Right now, we're just like peeping over our, 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 our nose and just, just watching through like from a window. Praise the Lord. But the time will come, Church of God, when we can drop these things and, and then we can see each other again. Praise the Lord. I want to welcome the Spirit of God in this place. Truly, as I entered, I recognized that God was here. Praise the Lord. We didn't have to invite him. He was here all along. Praise the Lord. He was waiting for us. Praise the Lord. And I, I listened to the songs and I listened to the expression of the saints and I said, truly, God is in this place today. Praise the Lord. I have a word that God has given to me and it's, it's been uh, divided up into three parts. And uh, pardon me, sir, greetings, Pastor Green, our, our, our president and senior pastor of this great ministry, and uh, our host pastor, who is not here today, Pastor Maurice Blagrove, greet you and your family, your lovely mother, and uh, truly want to greet everyone, all the saints of the Most High God, I greet you in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Our three-part uh, series that uh, God has given to me, is, the first part today is the blood. And... Uh, the second part we would deal with is the cross. And the last part to culminate it is the person involved, which is the man. Praise the Lord. But we must understand, you know, ever since the Holocaust happened, every year reflection on how gruesome the Holocaust was is always taught and it's always remembered. On November the 11th, it's Remembrance Day, and, and it's always said, lest we forget. Praise the Lord. So you remember the sacrifices that soldiers and the military and those who have died and those who have come back injured and, 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 and the state of the war, it's, we are asked to remember these things. Praise the Lord. And it's, it's, it's said that, you know, freedom comes at a price. When we, when we think about the blood and the composition of blood, as I studied for this, for this word, I recognized that blood is a complex fluid. Blood is a complex fluid. It contains mostly cells that is in what we call plasma. There are white blood cells and there are red blood cells. Good blood is crimson red. Praise the Lord. When, it is, when I say good blood, it is blood that has the right mix of oxygen in it. Praise the Lord. And blood that is deprived of oxygen, it starts getting darker. And blood that has no oxygen is basically black. Praise the Lord. But blood is the most important ingredient in your body. 
you're dressed with skin, but within that, 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 that body that is dressed with skin is blood from head to toe. And the function and purpose of that blood is to transport things through your body. Blood is actually a great transporter and you see many times people call blood actually life they call life blood and blood is life that's why they say when you're donating blood you, you have to give the gift of life praise the lord and sometimes people want to get a blood transfusion because their blood is tainted it's either not good or they don't have enough praise god as we sing these songs my mind reflect on the word because I'm saying we need to understand why we need to praise God. Praise the Lord. Because our blood was tainted by sin. And basically, God recognized that this blood is tainted, so you need a blood transfusion. Praise God. In the olden days, when most scholars believe that the first the first act of a blood sacrifice was when in the Garden of Eden that God killed the first animal and used it to clothe Adam and Eve. Praise the Lord. Thus the blood was acting as a cover. The blood was acting as a cover. The next time we recognized blood was when Abel gave his sacrifice to God. Praise the Lord. The Bible didn't tell us that it was commanded of Abel to give a blood sacrifice but that's what he gave and Cain's sacrifice that did not have, have blood as the, as the context his was rejected praise God we come down and now and we see that the blood is being used now after the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt and God is telling them that he's going to pass the death angel over the land he's going to kill the firstborn in every house but he instructed them to get an animal without spot, without blemish, and that they should kill this animal and put the blood on the doorposts and on the lentils of the door, of the windows. Praise the Lord. In this act, the blood acted as an identifier and also as a cover. Praise the Lord. Because God instructed Moses, he says, when you instruct the people to put the blood and they are obedient in doing it the way I say, and the death angel comes through that night, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Praise the Lord. So the blood acted in Exodus chapter 12 as an identifier, but also as a cover. Pastor Green. Praise God. When we think about the properties of blood, in the human blood, it transports oxygen through the body. It takes carbon dioxide out of the body, brings it to the lungs to be exhaled from the body. So the blood is not only bringing something into the body, the blood is taking something out of the body also. Praise the Lord. We need to understand the importance of the blood, the literal blood that we have, how important it is. I don't know if you, if you have ever seen blood. I know some folks, they can't stand the sight of blood. They'll just faint away. My brother, you, you, some of you know him, Brother Mendez. As soon as you get cut, he just faints away right away. Instantly, he faints away. He cannot stand the sight of blood. As I'm listening to the songs, Pastor Green, my mind is going back to the Levitical priesthood in Leviticus, and the priesthood begins, it was, everything was about the blood. Praise the Lord. For the sin offering, for the peace offering, for the trespass offering, for every offering, you had to bring a bullock, a young bullock, or a calf, or a goat, without spot, without blemish. You had to bring it into the temple, bring it for the priest. The priest now is going to lay his hand the, the offender has to lay the hand on the head of the animal transferring their guilt and their sin onto this animal praise the lord and then the animal would be slaughtered and its blood is going to be guilty blood taking away the guilt of the offender and sending the offender home free and the blood satisfies the desire 
The desire here being God saying, without the shedding of blood, there will be no remittance. So you cannot erase the sin of the, of the offender without the identifier. Praise the Lord. Again, I don't know for any of you who have been to a, a butcher shop or a place where they kill these animals. It's not a pretty sight, church. It's not a pretty sight. And my mind is in the tabernacle and you're bringing these animals. And you're killing these animals. Those areas are putrid. You can't stand the smell. It is putrid. Praise God. I want to, I want to bring our minds back, like how folks bring your minds back to the Holocaust and, and what happened at that time. I want to bring your minds back that we are living in a time when one sacrifice has been made for us, but we're going to take our minds back to if we had to live in that time, the amount of animals we would have to take to the temple regularly. Praise God. Regularly to cover our sins. Praise the Lord. So it was a kill zone. The temple, the tabernacle was a kill zone. Praise the Lord. So the significance and the purpose of the blood at that time was to atone for the sins of the people. The priest had to atone for his own sin and then he had to atone for the sins of the people. Praise the Lord. The blood had to be sprinkled throughout the congregation for the sins of the people. Praise God. Now we've got to recognize that when blood is spilled, Wherever the blood is spilled, that area becomes consecrated by God because he is accepting that sacrifice of blood. Praise his holy name. Many times we don't consider the means of our salvation. Many times we take salvation and the plan of redemption for granted. Praise the Lord. But if you understand the sequence of events and where you are in that plan of redemption, you will recognize that we are in a position that we should not even be asked to praise God. Amen. Praise the Lord. If, if, if you recognize that you want to praise God and you're living in a spirit of gratitude, you would have no time for gossip. Hallelujah. You would literally have no time for backbiting and complaining. Praise the Lord. So my mind is taking us back now to this tabernacle experience that you have to get your own goat, your own bullock. I have to get mine. We got to bring that to the temple because the blood of the animal makes our conscience free. Praise the Lord. So we leave that tabernacle with not a guilty conscience anymore because we have been free because that transgression has been transferred over to the animal. That animal has died in our place. Praise the Lord. Now I want to let you know, Church of God, that all these sacrifices in the Levitical priesthood, in the book of Leviticus, all these things pointed to one supreme sacrifice. And the Bible said, now without the shedding of blood, there will be no remission of sins. Praise God. Now, when the priest would transfer the sin from the individual over to the animal, you would recognize that the animal now cannot be set free. The animal has to be killed. Praise the Lord. Now, what significance is that to you and I? The Bible said that the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. The sin that you and I commit so easily, the payment for it is death. Praise God. Now when we understand how the blood works in the temple, you would recognize that uh, although I should have died, I came to the temple, I brought my bullock, I brought my goat, now I can leave the temple as a free man. I've brought my trespass offering, I have brought my peace offering, I have brought my sin offering, and now I am free to leave. Praise God. So your life has been spared. You go back out, 
You sin again, you come back again with another animal. Are we seeing how much animals is being, is being going through this process? Praise the Lord. But when we look at the plan of God, God had a plan to ultimately bring this sacrificial system to a close. Praise God. When we look at Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 6, let's go quickly to Isaiah 53 and verse 6. Isaiah is saying that all we like sheep have gone where? We have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him. And who to him is here? God hath laid on him Jesus Christ. The iniquity of us all. So God has taken mankind's sin collectively and have placed it on Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. When someone is killed or when someone is murdered, you have to understand, especially if it's a bloody thing, it's not a good, a good scene. It's not a good scene. I don't know if you've seen folks that have been stabbed or, or, or chopped. Uh, the blood is just... It just flows out of their bodies, Pastor Green. And it's not a pretty sight. Praise the Lord. So with Jesus Christ and, 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 and God putting this iniquity of the world upon him, now he is inescapable, Pastor Green. Just as the animal could not leave the tabernacle, the animal had to be killed once the sin has been transferred. Praise the Lord. So Jesus Christ, although he said in the Garden of Gethsemane, if it's possible, let this cup pass for me. He knew that he was a lamb that was slain from the foundations of the world. Jesus Christ was not a backup plan. When John saw him coming, John said, behold the lamb of God that was slain from the foundations of the world. Praise the Lord. I want us to understand how and why we are sitting here today. Praise the Lord. The how is because it's the sacrifice of God sending his own son to bear the sins of the world. Praise God. Now Jesus Christ could not die by poisoning. He couldn't die by a spear or a gunshot. That is why the Bible said, with his stripes, we are healed. He had to be, his body had to be stripped that the blood can flow out of it, Pastor Green. And by his stripes, the Bible said, we are healed. The blood had to flow. So Jesus Christ, although so many sought to kill him, as far as the Bible said, so many sought to kill him, he had to be crucified. Praise the Lord. When we're dealing with the cross, you'll recognize his mode of death. It was also prophesied that he should die in that way. Praise the Lord. So the, 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 the blood is significant in our salvation because of the Bible saying, without the shedding of blood, there will be no remission of sins. Let's turn to Hebrews chapter 9. We'll read from verse 18. Hebrews 9, 18. I'll jump through a few verses here. Whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying... This is the blood of the New Testament which God hath enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. 
And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood, there is no remission. Praise the Lord. We must understand that our sins has been blotted out and remitted only through blood. Praise the Lord. In this case, it's not the blood of bulls and of goats and of rams anymore. It's the blood of the Son of God. You see, man had to die for God to be pleased with the sacrifice of blood. But it had to be the blood of an innocent man. Don't know if you got that. Hence the reason why Christ had to put on flesh. Christ had to become man to die for man. Praise the Lord. His purpose is to shed human blood with a divine connection. Praise God. The means of our salvation. So if someone is not covered under the blood of Jesus Christ, he is none of his. There is no salvation in any other. Salvation came only through the blood of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. It is important that you understand that because for the next sermon about the cross, a lot of people think that the cross is saving them. It's all about the blood. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus Christ. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood. Praise the Lord. It shall never, Andrew Crouch said, it shall never lose its power. It reaches to the highest mountain. It flows to the lowest valley. The blood that gives me strength from day to day it shall never lose its power. Praise the Lord. It can reach you down in Africa. It can reach across India. It can reach down to Antarctica. It can reach all over to Australia. The blood, it encompasses everything. Praise the Lord. And God has made it through his divine plan that every person has access to it. It's not about who you know. It's not about how your bank account. Praise the Lord. I'm here to tell you it's not even about your clothes. It's not about your status in life. Praise the Lord. He has made the blood available to everyone. And that is the reason why we sing the song. That is the reason why we sing the songs, redeemed how I loved to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed through his infinite mercy. His child and forever I am. Don't let no one think or even imply that it is because of them you get salvation. Jesus Christ is the only means of our salvation. Amen. Bless the Lord. Sometimes we hold people hostage thinking that as if we were on that cross in Calvary. I'm here to wake you up and to let you know it's only through the blood of Jesus Christ. Not your husband, not your wife, not daddy, not mommy, not nana. Through the blood and the blood alone. Praise the Lord. And Christ made a way. Christ made a way. And when I look at his plan and how Jesus came, Galatians 4 says, When the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son. And many times I've heard many preachers preach about the blood. And I said to myself, I said, you know, God is something else. Why did he make all these animals die? But then that text came back to me in the fullness of time. God works according to his time, church of God. Praise the Lord. God has a plan for you, but he's working according to his time. Praise the Lord. Sometimes folks live and they didn't accept Jesus Christ until they're 73. Or 67. And then they live in regret and said, had I known how sweet it is, I would, have, I would have accepted Christ a long time ago, Pastor Green. Oh, how sweet to trust in Jesus. Just to take him at his word. 
just to rest upon his promise just to know thus saith the Lord praise the Lord so the priests had all their rituals and the priests it wasn't like priests like us today Pastor Green they were really working hard they were really working hard because they had to do all these butchering all these killings then you would recognize that they had to, there was parts, they had to use certain parts, and then certain parts they had to take out of the camp and burn it outside of the camp and burn everything. I want to let you know that when we go through a process of redemption and a process of salvation, the blood must touch every part of you. The blood must cover every part of you, your innermost being. The blood must reach your thoughts. The blood must reach your mind. The blood must reach the air you breathe. Praise the Lord. Because sometimes the body is saved, but the mind seems like it's still corrupt. Jesus Christ said, you know, you've got to fear the person who can destroy both body and soul. Praise the Lord. And I said to myself, going through this, I said, with all these rituals that the priest was doing, and now we as priests today, we are a kingdom of priests today, and every believer is a priest of God. Praise the Lord. But our only mandate now, my dear sister, my dear saints of God, our only mandate now is to make sure that we tell other people there is Point them to the blood. Point them to the blood. It's not Krishna's blood. It's not Allah's blood. It's not Muhammad's blood. Point them to Jesus Christ. Point them to Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. Because I can tell you, no good work. You can do all the good works you want. Not of good that I have done. Nothing can for sin atone. Praise the Lord. So if you meet individuals and they, they seem to be good folks, and you figure that's a, that, that person is a good person, but I'm here to tell you, if that person is not covered under the blood of Jesus Christ, every individual that is not covered by the blood, and, and the blood being the identifier, they're not saved. Let me say that again. Exodus chapter 12. There were individuals that did not believe Moses. And they did not apply the blood to their doorposts. And they died. There was Egyptians who believed Moses, Pastor Green. And they applied the blood to the doorposts. And they lived because God is no respecter of persons praise the Lord let's go quickly over to Hebrews chapter 10 we'll read a few verses there from verse 1 for the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually making the co commas thereunto perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered because that the worshippers once purged should have no more conscience of sin. But in those sacrifices there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Now that they, 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 they reach at a, at a crossroads. I thought it would take away my sin. I thought it would take away my sin, Pastor Green. It was only to satisfy. It was only to satisfy a just God. Praise the Lord. To appease my sin. Praise the Lord. 
So you're going to recognize why Jesus had to come. Praise his holy name. For it is not possible. That's not me saying that. This is the word of God. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away or absolve the sin. Praise God. Now, now we understand that Jesus shed his blood according as he should. That was the plan. Behold the Lamb of God that was slain from the foundation of the world. But you also have to recognize that the shedding of Jesus' blood does not automatically save you or me. Praise the Lord. I'll show you. Sometimes I collect coupons. And sometimes you can... Put the app in your phone so the coupon doesn't have to be paper anymore. You have it on the phone. But if you're going to purchase something and you don't have the coupon or you don't have the app, you're going to pay full price. You can't say, but I saw it for $8.99. How come you're telling me $14? Because you don't have the, 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 the slip to remit. Praise God. So you pay full price. So although that deal is there, you can't access the deal. So Jesus Christ shed his blood. It doesn't automatically save you unless you recognize and accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and as your Savior, saving you from the wages of sin. Praise the Lord. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made for your salvation. Praise God. That is why it's not automatic that father is saved, mother is saved, and children is automatically saved. No, there is no group policy. Amen. Salvation is an individual thing, and the Bible said, let every man work out his own, her own salvation with fear and trembling. So our duty is to inform the other person, you need to accept Jesus Christ as the one who made a sacrifice on your behalf to his father. Praise the Lord. So when God sees the blood of his son, he will pass over you. Praise the Lord. Sometimes you go into certain places and you go with certain people who are important and you're hoping that the important guy would say he is with me because if, that, if you separate yourself from him you can't get in if you separate yourself from the one sacrifice that was made on your behalf you can't get in into God's presence but because of the transaction that took place at Calvary now the Bible said we can come boldly before his throne because we have been granted permission through the blood of Jesus Christ praise the Lord so today you and I can identify as the people of God as the children of God as the purchased church of God because he purchased it with his blood praise the Lord hence the word saying you were bought with a price you're not your own You're not your own. You belong. I belong because I've been bought. And if you buy something, doesn't it give you possession of it, Pastor Green? I paid for that. Ship it for me. You were bought with a price. And the price was the blood of Jesus Christ. We have to recognize, Church of God, that uh, the blood as a cover, David said, blessed is the man whose sins are covered. Praise the Lord. A lot of people think that it contradicts with the word that says, if you cover your sin, you wouldn't prosper. There's two different sets of covers covering here, because the Bible did say that we should confess our sins confess our faults confession is what brings a release 
Praise the Lord. God ain't going to forgive you for something that you have not owned up to. Praise the Lord. So how does the blood work today in 2022, Pastor Green? The blood works in the very same way it did in the temple, in the tabernacle. With a different function and a different purpose. Praise the Lord. David said, and David was living in a time and a dispensation that was still law. That's why he came in Psalm chapter 51 and he said, Have mercy upon me, O Lord, according to thy loving kindness. And according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgression. Praise God. Cleanse me from my iniquity. The blood is a cleansing agent today. Praise the Lord. The blood is a cleansing agent. So the blood actually purifies the sinner. Come on, church of God. When you and I transgress, when you and I sin, and don't look at me so stunned because the Bible said that if any man say he has no sin, he's speaking the truth. So when you and I is in a state of imperfection and we transgress, we go back to God and we says, Consecrate me, sanctify me, wash me in the blood of the Lamb because it's an ever flowing system. Praise the Lord. That blood was shed once for the sins of the world, but it flows forever. Come on, church of God. When Jesus Christ was stripped and he was beaten, and from there he was forced to carry his cross, the same wooden structure that they would nail him to. And he was forced to take that up to Calvary. He was nailed onto it. It was held upright. As it was held upright, the blood poured from his body. That blood obviously dried on the ground. All right? Blood dries. But the efficacy of the blood lives forever. Come on, church. The efficacy of that one transaction pays it full right up until Jesus comes again. Praise the Lord. And that is why we preach and that is why we teach and that is why we invite others that the blood is still functioning. The blood will never lose its power. The blood will never lose its efficacy. Praise the Lord. The blood is still atoning for the sins of humanity. Praise God. And sometimes we judge each other and we say, oh, you don't know what she did, and you don't know what he did, and what he's doing up there, or what she's doing at the Lord's Supper table. Pastor Green, how come you are loving this foolishness? The blood prevails. The blood of the bleeding lamb. It has power to save. Praise the Lord. And that is why, as in the temple days, and they had to come regularly, now you go into God on a regular basis. Cover me, Father. Cover me, Lord. Because we sin in thought, we sin in word, and some of us literally sin in deed. Praise God. And sometimes I saw it on the police cruiser in York region, and on the, cruiser, on the side of the cruiser it says, Deeds speak. So when we sin... We come to the father and we say, Father, I have sinned. Just like the prodigal son. Acknowledge what we have done. And ask God to apply that blood that was shed at Calvary. Praise the Lord. There is no reason for you and I to carry sin and carry that weight of sin when it was already prepaid. Have you ever used a prepaid card? Not a credit card. You still have to pay that. People think credit card is, is free money. Until the debt collectors keep calling every day. But a prepaid card, it tells you you have a limit on it and it's paid. Some parents give it to their children. Bad idea. And it says, okay, you have a, a, you'll have a, a limit of maybe $25,000. And you can spend up to $25,000. Praise the Lord. The blood is a prepaid transaction. 
Come on, church. It, it is for you. It's also for your children. It's for your children's children and their children. Praise the Lord. It's a never-ending transaction. It's available through the ages. Praise God. And I want to let you know, since we spoke about the temple, when Jesus Christ died and at Calvary, and he says, it is finished, man's redemption was fully paid. And that went also, also retroactive to Adam and Eve. Understand that. It didn't just pay it forward. It also paid it retroactive. So all these blood of the bulls and the goats that could not resolve or absolve the sin, the blood of Jesus Christ went all the way back. Praise the Lord. And all those souls that have been absolved, all those souls through Jesus Christ have been saved and waiting for the day of resurrection. Praise the Lord. It's just a tremendous thing that God has done. The plan of salvation is really a tremendous thing that God has done. Praise the Lord. And that's why when it says, uh, say, say, well, I, I don't need nobody to worship God for me. We have to say, amen. No one can worship God for you. No one can be as grateful. You see these individuals in Ukraine and, and, and that speak on the, on, 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 on the TV and they're thanking this person and thanking that person for helping them, for those who is assisting in Poland, in Romania, and different places, and they're saying, I am forever grateful to that individual. They're going, as long as they live, they're going to be grateful. Because they have been rescued. Praise the Lord. It's the same thing for us, Church of God. As long as we live, we should be praising God. No moderator, no worship leader, have to keep prompting you and prodding you like they do with the horse in the races. To get the horse to run. And the cowboys with the spur to spur the horse. We should be worshiping God, understanding what he did through his blood. Praise the Lord. Understanding that it's the blood that saved me. It's the blood that prevails when I falter, Pastor Green. It's the blood that I can call upon and say, Lord, cover me under the blood of your son, Jesus Christ. Covered under the blood. So no more tabernacle with a bloody mess. Praise God. And blood sprinkling everywhere. No, the blood of Jesus Christ, although that you don't see it, on your suits and on your dresses and on your hats and on your Bibles, the blood is still present. The blood is not symbolic. It was actual blood. I want to let you know that. The blood is, Jesus' blood is not symbolic of anything, you know. It's actual a man, a God-man that died, lived and died, not no figment of our imagination. Literal blood was spilled from this man's body, as you would see in the next couple of weeks. So let us not take it for granted. Let us, lest we forget the sacrifice that this man made. Leaving the luxury of his father's side. Coming to earth and making friends with twelve and teaching them. And eventually allowing humans to, 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 to treat him the way that they did. We, we just have to wake up to what really our salvation is all about. Praise the Lord. And those of you who haven't accepted Jesus Christ, today is a day of salvation. Praise the Lord. You see, the length that God went, Pastor Green, is why when Jesus comes back as judge, there will be no, 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 no time to, um, to plead your cause anymore. Because he's making it available to you and I today. Today, if you would hear his voice, harden not your heart. Praise the Lord. 
If you're born again and you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and as your Savior, but you have backslided and you have not come back from your backsliding, you're going to die in your sin. You are going to die in your sin. The blood is available. It still flows. Praise the Lord. You can still accept Jesus Christ. You can still say to God, God, I've made a mistake. I've backslidden. And he says, return from me all, all your backsliding. And I will pardon you. I will heal you if you are willing and obedient. Come on, church of God. The blood is important because it is the only means of our salvation. Praise the Lord. Let us not be ficky about our salvation. When you, when you look at the cross and the man in the next two weeks, you would recognize how important you are to God. Praise the Lord. And the lengths that he went to bring you back into his good graces. The lengths that he went to purchase you. He is the same one that said, when you eat this fruit, you're going to die. But he sent his son, Pastor Green, that he will guarantee our freedom. Praise the Lord. You and I are free today because of the blood of the Lamb. And never forget what is being done on your behalf. Transactions being made in heaven on our behalf. Praise the Lord. The Lord bless you. I trust and hope that this word would really reach us, that we would understand the lengths that God went for us and save us from having to get bulls and, and turtle doves and pigeons and goats. All we got to do is to come to him in prayer and say, Father, forgive me for I have sinned. Praise the Lord. And he will forgive you. The Lord bless you in Jesus' name. For it reaches to the highest mountain, and it flows to the lowest valley. Oh, the blood that gives me strength from day to day. It will never lose its power. Amen. We're so thankful that we are here today to hear this wonderful word. We are grateful to you, Pastor Lynch, for allowing God to inspire you with this word. You've made some really amazing points. And the one that strikes me most is that I should always be grateful for what the blood has done. And I should never be asked to praise God when I consider what God has done for me. Amen. Amen. May the Lord continue to inspire your heart. Is there anybody in this house today who would like to give their lives to Jesus Christ who's not a Christian? If you are here today and you're not a Christian, and this word has impact on your life, we would like to pray with you. If you're watching online, you can put it in the chat. You'd like to give your life to Jesus Christ. You recognize that the blood still works and it has power to save just as in olden days. We want to pray with you. And so at this time, I'm going to ask you to bow your heads where you are. Father, we have asked your blessing on the service. We ask you to bless Pastor Lynch, that inspiration will come through him, and you have done it. As we sit and listen intently to what has been said, we are brought into awe of your great love and the work that was done at Calvary, and how even through the old ages, how you still protected man with the blood of animals, because you loved us so. Father, if anyone has been touched by this word today, who is not a believer, or who was a believer and who has stepped back,
pray, God, that they will commit to you now. Amen. Hallelujah. To let the blood work in their lives. Hallelujah. Amen. And to enrich them, to save them, to supply every need according to your riches and glory. Remember the preacher, Lord. We pray that you will guide his life. Strengthen him and keep him in thy grace. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. God bless you again. We'd like to give you a few announcements before we go. Thank you so much for coming out today. It's just a handful of us, but um, it's a start, and it's a good start. Amen? Amen, amen. amen. And we want to thank God uh, for all the uh, musicians, cameramen, everyone that has worked hard today. The 14th of April will be our Lord's Supper. We are looking to start at 630 so we are really asking everybody to try to be on time. We will actually start at 6.30, but we would like you to be here for the entire service. And it will be predominantly in-house. Now we do recognize that there are some individuals who might not be in a position to be here. And so for those persons, we would like you to let us know so we can make the appropriate arrangements to support you. So please call myself, Pastor Blagrove, uh, Pastor Lynch, Pastor Mark, uh, give them a call. Give us a call and we'll be more than happy to support you. I'm also delighted to let you know as well that the, the Brethren from the Spanish Assembly, the Church of God's uh, uh, Sabbath Keeping, Spanish Assembly, started back their worship today as well. That's a whole bu bunch of them over on the other side worshiping. It was so great to see them. So, you know, I'm not sure if they're still there, but it's wonderful. Um, and so greetings to all our Brethren who do call us from time to time from South America. So continue to pray them up, brethren. They're doing a good work uh, with the uh, uh, Spanish-speaking community. And my final thought to you today is, I think tomorrow is going to be the, um, the Sunday night service. And I think it's a special service, right? Am I correct? It's for the, for the, the women. Yeah. All right, so the sisters will be ministering tomorrow's Sunday night service. And so uh, please, you know how to get on. It's the same login, right? Um, and so we're looking forward to hearing our sisters minister um, and strengthen each other in Jesus Christ. Uh, finally, uh, the concert. It's happening. It is here. Um, is it on the screen? Uh, let's put it on the screen, please. Um, so uh, it's $15 per person for the tickets, and it, it's purchased online. If you, if you don't have access to purchase it online, we are actually going to be here at the concert. So if you want to come in, that's fine, because the government has released the uh, um, restrictions. So if you want to physically come in the building, that's okay. But we are looking to get you to, to purchase your tickets online. It's only $15. Uh, our goal is to raise $15,000, and that's for new equipment. Uh, we also have uh, part of our missions work. As you know, Bishop is working hard in Pakistan, um, and we want to get that building finished and the fence put up. Um, and there are many other ministry work that we're doing across the globe. Um, and so we're looking forward to uh, your support. I must say that I am indeed privileged uh, to part of that missions work is the work that Deacon Brackett started in Jamaica. And I'm privileged to tell you today that in June of this year, we will be having our first Church of God Sabbath keeping in Jamaica. That is the first launch. And we are so excited about that. Amen. And we, amen, to God be the glory. We, we are anticipating that it will be one of many that will be established um, throughout the island and throughout the Caribbean and other parts of the world. But Bishop is working very hard, moving to, I think he said he's moving to Germany or one of these places uh, to start another work. So that man is on fire for God. Just incredible human being. So the concert is to help the missions as well as to buy equipment, and our target is $15,000. And so outside of the concert tickets that we're purchasing, we're looking for everybody to come together. We're looking for donations. We're looking for contributions um, so that we can uh, do this. And I'd say this last component of it, I'm hoping that we can put the information on the screen. Seems like I'm out of support here. Um, but what we're actually asking for is that once we purchase new equipment, we have come up with a new policy and that is that we are actually going to recycle our old equipment. In the past, what we used to do was keep them and take it back to the store, 
and get money for it. But we have decided that we want to do something better. We want to give our older equipment or previously used equipment to younger ministries so that they can build their ministries and build their, 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 their systems. And so that's the policy that we have come up with. We think it's a wonderful thing that we're helping other churches and ministries grow. and We're not just thinking about ourselves. And so your contribution will go a long way to ministry and to help us uh, fund other congregations. And so thank you in advance for your support. Um, if you don't know how to get online and you just want to give your donation, you can see myself at Omari um, or one of the uh, persons on the worship experience team. This brings our service right now to its end. We are actually going to enter into a baptism service. And so um, uh, two candidates will be baptized today. And so we're going to be, if you would like to stay behind, it's a very short service. Um, we would like to encourage that. And so our online guest uh, will have the privilege to do that as well. We'll close this link and then we'll reopen another link for the baptismal service. Would you stand for the benediction for this part of the service? May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and grant you peace both now and forever. Let the church say, Amen. Praise the Lord God. If you have to go, you may leave now, but if you would like to remain for the baptism, we're certainly encouraging you to stay behind, and uh, we're going to start right away. Chris, I agree.